May 19, 1975. The day that's etched in my mind until the day I die. A beautiful summer day it was. One of the neighborhood girls leaned out the window and said, hey guys, it was a man shot up at Mr. Robinson's store and he's laying on the ground dead. Kwame Ajamu was just a kid when he was falsely convicted of murder and sent to Ohio's death row based on the testimony of a 12-year-old boy who would later recant. When I went to prison, I was 17. When I got out, I was 45. Yeah. And it would take another 11 years to exonerate him to finally prove his innocence. It took us 40 years. The sad part about it was all six of my great aunts passed away. My grandfather, my oldest brother, my oldest sister, a nephew, two cousins, three friends, something that money can't buy and a little bitty lie is ripped from me. The stories of lives stolen, of time lost, are now the subject of an exhibit by artist Martin Scholler, known for his portraits of some of the world's most famous faces. Collaborating with the nonprofit Witness to Innocence, Scholler has spent the past year crisscrossing the country in an RV, it's definitely a passion project of mine. I want to help abolish the death penalty here in the United States. Meeting and photographing those who were wrongly accused and sentenced to death. This is one small way maybe to contribute. What drew you to this project? I always wanted to do something uh, around the subject matter of the death penalty. It is only about revenge and Revenge doesn't make a society better. While death sentences have declined in the U.S., 27 states still allow capital punishment, and roughly 2,500 individuals currently face execution. Research shows that for every nine executions, one person on death row has been exonerated or had their conviction overturned. Since 1976, 185 death row inmates have been exonerated. Martin, you photographed some very famous people from Oprah, President Obama. How is that different from the photographs of these people who have had traumatic but also triumphant stories? Well, you know, I work, uh, I get to photograph all these very famous, well known people because of magazine assignments. With this project, it's very different because I, you know, looked into the, in this organization that I uh, ended up um, falling in love with. And with it comes obviously a, a, a huge responsibility that sometimes can feel a bit overbearing to make sure the work I create really has an impact. So anything they throw away, I keep it. For this, Schroeder spent months getting to know his subjects. I love doing this. I could do this all day. Before finally using his camera, to snap a moment in time that often tells the story of decades-long trauma. Masuja Graham grew up on a plantation in the segregated South before moving to Los Angeles when he was a child. That's where my trouble began, right there in South Central Los Angeles. You didn't have to say yes, sir, and no, sir, to white people. And I joined neighborhood gangs, just like every other young kid, in and out of juvenile halls. When you look back at that, what do you think was the driving force for your getting into trouble as a kid? Lack of opportunity, indifferent towards everything. You don't By 18, serving time in prison you. and a leader in the everything growing Black Panther movement. But from behind bars, he would be wrongfully accused and later convicted for murdering a prison guard during a riot. A uprising happened in that prison, and a human being, a guard named Jerry Sanders, was murdered. I remember coming down and said, they said the jury and come back, and they found him guilty. It would take six long years before his death sentence was overturned, the court noting that black jurors had been systematically excluded. It would take two more years for him to be found innocent and finally released. I can remember like yesterday, 
They stood it up, and I didn't want to be the first one because they didn't want to hear it. But I stood it up, and they said the jury found me not guilty. I can remember saying, after 11 long years, my greatest nightmare has finally come to an end. Research shows people of color have accounted for a disproportionate 43% of executions since 1976. Black people in this country are seven times more likely to be wrongfully accused of murder than their white counterparts. Our time with Scholars coincided with the racial reckoning after the death of George Floyd. Like much in the United States, this too is a system that deeply impacts minorities. I had a visceral reaction to watching George Floyd's death. And I can't imagine someone who's been on death row and exonerated. Um, did you see yourself in him lying on that ground? That's one of the reasons I say I'm a survivor. We've been dealing with this since I was a little kid, police brutality and racism, and we're still dealing with today because we've been in denial about it. Martin, when you approach any subject, is there a particular thing you're looking for? You know, it's always important to listen and to try to figure out where this person is coming from, no matter who it is you meet. I think listening is the most important. Schiller, in part, is drawn to this work having grown up in post-Nazi Germany, grappling with questions about humanity and government, and those society deems disposable. Yeah, so I always wanted to do something about, you know, the death penalty. It's like insane. After Germany, what the Nazis did, how can you believe in any government? Because they did set on revenge. Revenge is a big thing in the United States, it seems like. My name is Sabrina Butler, and I'm the first woman to be exonerated in the United States from death row. I was tried and convicted in 1990 for the death of my son. In 1989, a teenage Sabrina rushed her young child, Walter, to a Mississippi hospital after he stopped breathing. He would die the next day. She was arrested for child abuse. She says from the bruises on Walter from her attempts to resuscitate him. A year later, she was convicted of murder. That term friend is hard to find nowadays. People are not your brother's keepers anymore. She filed an appeal and was later cleared court finding the prosecution failed to prove it was anything other than a tragic accident. A medical examiner reversing course and concluding the boy died of a kidney malady. I mean, it's just so incredible that one minute they're being called monsters and animals and, uh, you know, our, our system is trying to execute them. And then all of a sudden they let go and said, you know, sorry, we made a mistake. Oops. Oops. We did a DNA test and turns out the murderer is somebody else. Or is a 12-year-old kid is the only, uh, only witness to a crime? And then people get sentenced on death row. For 28 years, Kwame was in prison. Decades later, the young witness whose testimony sent Kwame away recanted. It was beautiful. You know, it was just the greatest day ever. Because I had completed the mission I started. It's a mission now immortalized in photographs, images of both injustice and overcoming, which were displayed in New York City, online, and in the National Geographic spread. It makes me feel like, uh, you know, I finally made it. You know, I'm finally accepted as one of, one of the people that was just regular, you know? Yeah, that's yeah, a good thing. That's a good thing. When you heard about Martin's project, portraits are very personal. Why did you want to help him on his mission? To show that people like myself, just like we put a face, that we're human beings. I'm hoping that by these, these few little scenes going out into the world, and Martin doing what he's doing, that we can get some more soldiers on, and those soldiers will be the ones that have the ultimate decision power to make all this go away. That's what I truly hope. Our thanks to Pierre.
You can read more stories in the series Sentenced to Death But Innocent at NatGeo.com.